if poverty can be beaten, <laughs> uh, what is the key to get rid of poverty? Well, I wish there were a simple answer to that question and that I could delineate there are these three things that if everybody does them, we can get rid of poverty. However, we know it can be done. That, that's the most important thing. We have examples of societies that have by and large eradicated poverty in the sense of the way people lived three or four hundred years ago. So, so they have provided an example of how this could be done. I think the economics profession has, has been lacking in really gaining a deep understanding of the historical phenomena by which these societies have have come out of poverty. There, there have been these experiments that have occurred not in front of us because they are in the past, but which are amenable to exploration. And out of that exploration does come a lot of lessons. We also have examples in our time of societies trying lots of things to get out of poverty. And so we also have the results of those experiments in trying to do things that we can learn from. And this, this, this empirical approach, historical empirical approach to trying to understand the experience of the attempts to get out of poverty has yielded some conclusions in my view, and that's in fact what my book, The Power of Productivity, is about. Uh, what, are, what have the natural experiments in, in the major economies of the world over the last 50 years really revealed about how to get out of poverty? And one of the most important things that, that comes out of that, that survey of, of the experience of the last 50 years is that most fundamentally, the, the expression of individual rights in societies and the way it manifests itself in the way consumers feel about what they are entitled to, what they have a right to expect, and, and how they, they go about trying to achieve what it is they want in terms of consumption, that then leads to conditions in the society, and they are primarily conditions of a, of a level playing field for competition among producers. That means that the most efficient and most productive producers tend to be the successful ones, and they develop and innovate and provide better products and better services for the consumer. That sort of consumer-oriented societies, those societies are the ones that have been most successful in bringing their people out of poverty. And the conditions that, that then make that possible go way back historically to, to issues of political philosophy. The, those societies that have, have been based on political philosophies fundamentally protecting individual rights have been the societies that, that so far have been the ones, this is, this is empirically, uh, they have been the ones that have been successful in bringing people out of poverty and achieving high levels of economic development. There's nothing that says that's the only path that's possible, but it is the only example that we have so far of a way to do this. And so the, the issue becomes is how do societies evolve from, from other points of view about the position of humans in society and the roles human plays uh, in, in the organization of societies, how do, you, how do you evolve from the many different points of view about that into a point of view that's uh, focused on the individual and what the individual is entitled to, has rights to, and can, has reason to expect in terms of both economic and political performance. And when those conditions are met, societies have developed economically. The problem is we, we, we don't have a very good understanding of how societies come to have this point of view to start with. Historically, we know it has risen in the West with the first manifestations of this very briefly in Greek civilization. And then it went dormant for almost 2,000 years and suddenly reappeared uh, uh, in the Enlightenment period in Western Europe uh, in the 18th century. And so it's only been very recently that these ideas have been around on a scale large enough to affect the way societies behave. But the societies that are the inheritors of the 
Western European Enlightenment tradition have been the ones that had this political philosophy and they have been the ones that have developed to very high levels of economic performance. How other societies come to have this, this point of view is a great problem. Uh, we don't understand very much how to have it occur and it's especially difficult because other societies today don't really feel they want it very much. They, they, are, they actually are reasonably content with their own political philosophies and they're not feeling any sense of urgency to change and they certainly don't accept the connection between this political philosophy based on individualism and high economic performance. They think there are other ways to do that. Given that situation and that complication, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult for, for other societies to, to come out of poverty and reach high levels of economic development in the way the Western democracies have. And it's problematic because we haven't seen examples of it being accomplished any other way yet. That doesn't mean we won't, but if I were a betting person, I certainly wouldn't want to bet very much on it. Now I'm in the middle of a financial crisis. Many people claim that the West is in crisis. Is the West in crisis? Well, not yet. <laughs> uh, this is a very short-term phenomenon. Uh, you and I have been talking about a societal process and evolution over a period of a few centuries. And then suddenly we're talking about a so-called crisis that's been in existence maybe a little over 12 months and it hasn't been very intense until maybe the last month. So in a historical sense, this is still a pretty small phenomenon. It doesn't feel that way to people in the middle of it, but, but historically uh, with that perspective, uh, this is still pretty small. After all, it has not dropped a vast majority of people in the Western democracies and certainly <laughs> not in the United States suddenly into poverty in the sense of living the way people did three or four hundred years ago. The real economy in the US uh, has yet to be measured as, as, as going down in GDP. Uh, the second quarter numbers, as, as you know, were really for, for reasonably normal growth. Nobody expects that to be the third quarter numbers, but at the same time, nobody's expecting a big drop in the third quarter numbers either. Now that may happen in the fourth quarter or early in 2009, but again, nobody's talking about a drop of a more than a few percentage points. Uh, to be 94 or 95 percent as wealthy as you were a year before is something a lot of people will bemoan, but it's by no means dropping back into poverty. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis, for sharing these ideas with us, and thank you very much.